centuries ago. An unknown land, its uncharted wilderness, a challenge. Now a leader of the world, a nation of 150 million people who enjoy, as no one else anywhere, the blessings of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The United States of America, vast, rich, dynamic. All across this fabulous land, matchless cities rear lofty towers of hope and ambition in stone and steel. Symbolic beacons of man's achievement under a system of free enterprise and representative government. Cities, centers of the nation's economic strength and cultural expression. Cities, clearing houses for America's mammoth structure of industry, agriculture, and finance. Ocean to ocean, Canada to the great gulf. The land is an infinite treasury of natural resources. Productive timberlands cover one-fourth of the nation's land area, assure an adequate supply of forest products for myriad industries. Lakes, rivers refresh the land and serve the people. Rich stores of minerals, coal, copper, aluminum, iron, gold, silver, zinc, lead, manganese, and many, many more are wrested from the earth, skillfully converted into necessities and luxuries. These unsurpassed natural resources make America a colossus of productive power. From this fertile land, nine million farmers produce an abundant variety of agricultural products. A bountiful supply of the bread and meat that makes Americans the best fed people on earth. Industrial America, the amazing accomplishment of inventive genius built with the brain and brawn of a free, aggressive people. In a quarter of a million factories throughout the land, workers are turning out goods of incredible variety and quality. Industrial wealth beyond compare. And all of this vast agricultural and industrial development and production is dependent upon mass transportation. American railroads move anything, anywhere, anytime. They provide the most efficient, dependable transportation in the world. The purchasing power of the American people is unequaled anywhere. The American people work hard and spend freely. America is a nation of homes, large, small, modest and pretentious. They represent comfort and security, a pleasant family life. Power behind this great nation is coal. Utilization of heat and power is a necessity to progress. In America, by far the greatest single source of heat and power is coal. A primary use of coal is in the home. Today, prepared coal is burned scientifically in modern, efficient furnaces fed by mechanical stokers. The domestic consumer demands an economic fuel of high quality, and he asks for equipment designed especially to burn. Through extensive research and experimentation, the bituminous coal industry and the stoker manufacturer, working hand in hand, fulfill this consumer demand to provide the utmost in fuel satisfaction. Schools, factories, and office buildings are heated uniformly and economically with bituminous coal. Most large buildings burn especially prepared coal in furnaces fed by mechanical stokers. This prepared coal is clean. It leaves the minimum of ash and produces maximum heat. The experience of millions of users establishes that coal is the one fuel which is always dependable. Bituminous coal creates almost 50% of all the energy used to drive the wheels, generate the current, provide the light and power that American commerce requires. And some of it goes into the making of the world's tastiest hot biscuits, too. Our public utilities use bituminous coal as the primary agent for the production of gas and the generation of electrical power. Thus, coal's energy is transmitted into other forms. Coal is indispensable in the manufacture of iron and steel. Coke, 
a byproduct of coal, is used as a principal heating agent in producing steel from iron ore. Steel for skyscrapers, steel for bridges, steel for railroads, for machinery and tools, for plows, steel for national defense. Coal is the major railroad fuel, providing the power behind that indispensable system of mass transportation. And it powers ships which plow the seven seas. But coal is far more than a fuel. It is the most prolific raw material known to chemistry. The magic of modern industrial chemistry has produced innumerable new products and better replacements for old ones. In today's byproduct plant, coal is burned in airless ovens. And from this wondrous mineral are extracted coke, gases, ammonia, and coal tar, basis for a multitude of modern chemicals. Coke and gas used as fuel are the greatest bulk byproduct of bituminous coal. Ammonia, versatile byproduct of coal, yields many amazing derivatives. Refrigeration agents for the preservation of meats and other perishables. Fertilizers, a major ammonia derivative. Plastic, camera film, lacquer. Explosives for mines, quarries, munitions. Coal tar is another major derivative of coal. It is used in the paving of smooth, long-lasting highways and in the form of creosote and the important preservation of wood. And coal tar is the miracle substance of modern industrial chemistry. Black magic can attest to. It is the source of an unbelievable variety of valuable products. From this black coal tar comes a rainbow range of colors and shadings of synthetic dyes. Synthetic flavors, too. Wintergreen, vanilla, almond, peppermint, and saccharin, the sweetest of them all. Modern medicine is thoroughly dependent on coal tar. The sulfur drugs, adabrin, aspirin, antiseptics, anesthetics, and countless other healing agents come from lowly coal tar. Yes, coal is a paradox. It is the basis for explosives and poison gases. Yet, from it come delicate perfume. The breath of romance, no less varied than the odors of natural flowers. Beauty again, sheer lovely hosiery spun from nylon. Another magic creation from that black, smelly, sticky substance, coal tar. This amazing bituminous coal industry is the keystone in the economic structure of America. The industry in the United States has a capital investment in plant and property of over $4 billion. It employs 375,000 workers who are paid over $1,200,000,000 annually. And it spends over $100,000,000 a year for supplies and equipment. Its direct and indirect employment combined provide a livelihood for some 4 million men and women who spend millions upon millions of dollars for food, for clothing, and for other necessities and luxuries of life. And this great industry is an example of enterprise free from monopoly. 5,000 companies operate 9,000 mines. Thousands of independent dealers throughout the country are in the business of selling and delivering coal to the consumer. And a host of manufacturers and dealers produce or sell coal-consuming equipment. Bituminous coal ranks above all other commodities in railroad tonnage and revenue. The railroads themselves use about one-sixth of the total annual production. Thus, the railroad and the coal industries are partners, each dependent upon the progress and welfare of the other. For centuries, the empire of black diamonds lay buried beneath the rugged mountains, inaccessible to the world until the railroad came. 
To serve the coal industry, the Norfolk and Western Railway spends many millions of dollars for efficient, adequate coal handling facilities. It designs, builds, and maintains in its own shop fleets of powerful coal-burning steam locomotives, especially designed for moving heavy tonnage trains. In the railway's great shop, workers build thousands of sturdy steel coal cars designed to meet the varied needs of shippers and receivers of coal. Normally, 14 cars roll off the N&W's Roanoke, Virginia shop assembly line in an eight-hour day, or one every 34 minutes. The railroad maintains great inland terminals. Through Portsmouth, Ohio, 102 miles of track with 10,000 car capacity flows about two-thirds of all the coal handled by the railway. In addition to inland terminals, the Norfolk and Western Tidewater facilities at Lambert's Point near Norfolk, Virginia, are rated among the finest in the world. With considerably more than half the world's known coal reserves and a stupendous industrial demand, the United States of America occupies first place among the coal-producing countries of the world, accounting for nearly one-third of the annual world's production. Its value exceeds that of our combined annual production of gold, silver, copper, and iron. Richest in point of value are the coal deposits of the eastern area, containing probably nine-tenths of the high-ranked coal of the country. The Appalachian region, from northern Pennsylvania and to Alabama, is a huge depository of bituminous and semi-bituminous coals of the highest rank. Part and center of this region is the territory served by the Norfolk and Western Railway, on whose lines are mined the world-famed Pocahontas, Tug River, Upper Buckhannon, Thacker, Canova, and Clinch Valley coals, so universally accepted as a criteria of fuel satisfaction. The mountains of southern West Virginia, Western Virginia, and Eastern Kentucky are dotted with hundreds of coal tipples. Let's follow these men into the mines and see how coal is produced. In this shaft mine, the workers enter cages or elevators and descend hundreds of feet into the earth to their job. Drift mine entries shoot horizontally into the sides of mountains. In both drift and shaft mines, the men ride electric trains underground to the points of operation. The modern coal mine is a far cry from the days when miners laboriously hauled coal with mule and cart. A man of tremendous importance in coal mining is the experienced safety inspector, better known as the fire boss. His job starts long before the miners begin working. Before each shift enters the mine, before a single passage is worked, he carefully checks for gas. He uses an extremely sensitive instrument, the methane detector. His OK must be on the face of the coal before operations begin. At the working face of a coal seam, the first operation is cutting. This huge alligator-like machine with swift revolving blades is moved to the coal face and cuts deep gashes across the bottom and center of the coal to be blasted, thus increasing the efficiency of the charge of dynamite or compressed air to come. During the cutting operation, the machine operator tests once more for gas. Sometimes the cutting machine is used to shear the face vertically. With either vertical or horizontal cut, the coal blasts down evenly with only a little explosive and without excessive breakage. 
And now the miner drills holes in the working face so that charges can be placed to blast the greatest amount of coal with the least explosive. The charge is tamped into the drilled holes carefully, and electric fuses are connected to a battery box. The switch goes down, the coal is blasted, and a pile of black lumps will soon become a prepared fuel product. After sturdy wooden props have been erected to prevent slate falls, one of the newest of mining machines is pushed into place, the automatic coal loader. Then a string of empty cars moves up to the fallen coal and the loader begins its magic work. A water spray is used to eliminate dust. Motors collect the loaded cars from the working faces and assemble them into strength. Throughout the day and night, these long trains come rolling from the depths. Over 500 million tons a year in the United States, a continuous flow of bituminous coal. In shaft mines, loaded cars are hauled to the elevator, and up they go, hundreds of feet to the top of the shaft, where they are automatically dumped into a chute leading to the tipple. In drift or horizontal mines, loaded trains buzz from the interior and sometimes run several miles along the mountainside before reaching the top of the tipple, called the head house. At the head house, each car is run to a rotary dumper and quickly turned over. The coal spills into a conveyor belt. Another example of the newer mining equipment and the car quickly returns to the track as another takes its place. The belt conveys the coal without breakage or dust. Shaker screens on the tipple grade the coal according to size. Black, pea, nut, sole, egg, and lump. The smaller sizes are washed by air or water to eliminate foreign matter. Larger sizes pass directly to the picking tables where keen-eyed experts spot and remove slate and rock. After the washing and cleansing, coal is re-screened, assuring a clean, uniformly sized product. Coal passes next to a flexible loading boom poised above railroad cars. It flows gently and evenly into the big cars as automatic sprays sprinkle it with oil or other chemicals. This is the famed dustless treatment, the final operation in the production of clean fuel satisfaction. Thus, the process of mining, grading, and preparation is completed. The finished product is ready to roll. From the myriad spur lines up hidden mountain hollows, from more than 100 mines in southern West Virginia, western Virginia, and eastern Kentucky, come the mine trains to assemble in the great inland yard. Then the mightiest steam power of the Norfolk and Western Railway begins its long trip for hundreds of miles over the steep mountain grades across the Allegheny, westward to the great manufacturing centers and to the lake port, eastward to other centers of industry, and down to the sea.
A railroad, a potent driving force with a tremendous job to do. A job that is carried on every hour of every day and in the darkness of night, in rain and sleet and burning sun, swiftly and efficiently. Without the railroad, there could be no mass movement of this vital commodity. From the steep peaks to the hilly lands, to the broad valleys, to the coastal plains, trains rushed toward the sea with their cargoes of black diamonds. Most impressive of all Norfolk and Western coal handling facilities is the great ocean terminal at Norfolk, Virginia. Here, the interminable strings of loaded cars rush from the west to meet the steady stream of ocean-going vessels. Here, the coal commerce of America rubs elbows with other commerce of our own land and the nations of the world. Vast, complex, a maze of tracks converging on gigantic steel piers, thrusting their girders over deep water. This is Lambert's point. Let's see what takes place when ships come here for coal. As the ship approaches, yard crews shift cars into position from which they drift by gravity to the scale. Meanwhile, a sturdy tug moves over the blue water to meet the freighter. It shepherds the ship to the pier, recognized as one of the most modern and efficient coal piers in existence. The tug noses her big charge alongside. It is docked and loading operations are ready to begin. Now the cars of coal ordered for this ship are rolling slowly across the scale. An automatic instrument of wondrous precision weighs each car. Weights are transmitted by telautograph to the pier office. The car drifts on down to the Barney house. The cars are carried through this entire operation by remote control. The Barney, sometimes called the mule, emerges from the pit and pushes the coal car up the incline. The car drifts through the steam thawing shed used to facilitate the dumping in cold weather. Emerging, it passes upon a retarding device which slows it down. The switch is thrown, the mechanical brain controlling the amazingly synchronized operation is in motion. The great pan which will receive the coal is lowered to the ship. As each car passes the pier office, it is finally checked off as delivered to the ship. Entering the elevator, the loaded car bumps off a returned empty and is automatically locked into position. The elevator is set. A rubber-covered retarding device on the great pan moves into position to receive the coal. Now the car with its top covered with an overlapping hood is turned on its side. The coal slowly spills out the gate of the hood, rolls gently into the path. The retarder backs slowly before the coal, easing it into the telescopic chute. An automatic chemical sprinkler adds an exact moisture content to meet specific demand. Now the great telescopic chute, filled with coal, moves closer to the ship's deck. 
It is projected slowly down into the deep hold of the vessel. This chute is a huge and intricate mechanism, but highly flexible. The tremor, or conveyor, slides from the chute's mouth. The tremor, another of the coal distribution industry's newest machines, is an almost human as it directs the flow of coal to the farthest corners of the hold and spreads it evenly. The long trip from mine to ship's hold is complete. The empty car is lowered to the pier track level and is bumped from the elevator by the oncoming loaded car. The empty rolls down the incline and up the switchback. It reverses direction and rolls back on the return track into the empty yard, soon to rejoin a train of other empties for the journey west, back to the mountains and the mines to be loaded again and again in the endless cycle of production. The ship is full, the job is done, and soon this great coal carrier will steam out to sea. But other ships will come to take more cargoes of coal, coastwise ships from the north and south, and ships from afar off across the seven seas. For the need for coal is universal, and the fame of fuel satisfaction is world-renowned. And so, in a world where the power of harnessed energy is vital to progress, the United States of America looks with pride upon its vast stores of unexcelled coal. For coal is power. It is the greatest single source of heat and energy convertible to the needs of mankind. By the use of coal, man has made iron his slave. And by the use of iron, man rules the world. Through the wizardry of modern industrial chemistry, coal now emerges as the most useful raw material known to man, a prolific source of an infinite variety of valuable materials. Without coal in abundance, industrial development as it exists in the United States today could not have been possible. The Norfolk and Western Railway is proud of its contribution to the nation's progress in providing indispensable transportation for coal, the power behind the greatest nation on Earth.